ABM, ABM, that's down bass magnifier. I didn't want to call it an amplifier. So it wanted to be more than a bloody amplifier. So we called it a magnifier and uh, it kind of stuck. Um, and the magnifier bit came with adding the octave as well. It magnified the sound to be more than a normal amp. That was the whole premise between called an ABM. So Ashdown Bass Magnifier and the name stuck and ABM stuck. We started off with a 400 and then made a 200. Then Mr. Entwistle wanted a bigger one, so we made him a 900. And the first one, which we've reissued with the 25th anniversary, um, you've got input, passive, active, shape. Now the shape is that classic mid-cut bass boost, treble boost. Um, and we, we designed it in the stage that when it left the building, that was in, you had to defeat it. So when you plugged in a shop, you know, because you, know, you only get a few seconds in a store, and you played a couple of lights, you went, wow, damn, that's, that's huge, you know, because you're big bottom, big top. One of the great things on the early ABMs, and uh, Stuart Zender was, was, a, was a great advocate of this, and Godzilla, um, if you turn an ABM all the way up, overdrive at the input so it's distorted to hell, turn the octave on, turn the tube up, and there you have the Godzilla sound. Dun, 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 dun. It's, it's an outrageous overdrive, and the amp can stand all that. You're not doing any harm. That's input. You, you know, you're not driving the output to destroy the speakers of the power section, which is very unlikely. They would always designed to be kind of bulletproof. That was the front end of it, getting the tube so you could send set in. And the tube wasn't there for overdrive, it was there for third harmonics. It was there to add some nuances to the sound. You can drive it, but most companies have put a valve in the front end, they, they cheat. They just add some uh, diodes and they add some overdrive so it does more than the valve. The valve on the front end doesn't do a lot. And it's also wonderful sucks the sound out of a passive bass brilliantly. And that's why people tend to find P's and J's with the ABMR phenomenal. It's just pulls the sound out of your pickups, pulls the sound into the bass. So having that set up on the front end is very nice and getting that balance of harmonics in it. And you can hear it as you're pulling off, it's, it's wonderful. Um, and then go through to a nice EQ. Again, I touched on that earlier that didn't really want to have the sliders in, just wanted bass, middle and treble, but the sliders for more detail. And then lots of people just trying to get that little little tweak here and there. So we put some sliders in and to balance. And uh, you know, they've got plus or minus 15 dB on the sliders um, and, and on the rotary. So you've got a huge um, shelving situation. They all balance and as you said, they all interact with each other. Um, a little bit like a passive EQ would do on a valve amp, but they're not passive, it's active. Um, but they, they do cascade, they do all interact with each other, so the more you have, the more you get in different frequencies. Um, and then being able to switch the EQ in and out, so you go from flat with the shape, with the shape on top of the EQ. The range of tones you've got out of this thing is, is phenomenal. And then, of course, you come into um, our lovely octave, which, again, touched on that. It is about fattening the sound up. It isn't about being an octave as such as you'd expect an octave. I just want to make things bigger. And then you get to your output control and uh, a DI, you have a, a P and post EQ, DI effects and return. Um, you, you, you always stand up. In the early, early ones, um, we had a sub-octave out. So it was filtered out, so it took everything um, basically below 50 hertz only. It filtered all above it out. And that went down into uh, a, a, a sub-out. And back then, uh, we built a 1,000 watt powered cabinets um, just for that sake because um, I was very into proper bass um, so that was a thousand watt powered uh, single 15 and we did an 18 as well um, so that's not a feature people don't use things like that anymore which is a pity people are into mega portability um, and but ha guys yeah a little amp's fantastic I can throw you the little head behind me and class D's it's one handle. How hard is it to carry a proper amp and have that ballistic headroom that you've got when you touch a string and you know it's going to reverberate, it's going to sustain, and you're going to have balls to it? You know, um, Class D is fantastic and we make and sell an awful lot of them, but you still cannot beat um, big lumps of metal to give you that sustain. Thank you.
So I think the APM uh, with a crossover between tube and valve, and I think it's one of the closest, most versatile crossover amps you can get in the world to have all those features we've got in and, uh, and headroom at the same time, but not be a valve amp that can damage, that can overheat, that can cost money in repairs. The, the ABM to me is just the most versatile beast of an amp uh, that I think anyone could ever need. And yes, it's a little bit heavy, but you can still carry an 810 on wheels behind you and an ABM in one hand, put the amp on top of the 810 and wheel it. It's not hard unless you've got stairs to go up, of course. Then you get roadie. Anyway, um, that's that 25th. It comes in an amazing, beautiful fight case as part of it. They're all signed. The most we'll ever make is 100. Mm -hmm.